let's say that you are writing a research thesis and you have decided to go for probability sampling techniques and you would like to find the right technique for you. Now, you will need to go through three steps herein. The first step is going to be that you need to construct what we call a sampling frame. The second step is going to be that you need to decide the sample size. And finally, you are going to select the sampling technique. So in this video, we are going to go through all three of these steps. So first step is about identifying our sampling frame. What is a sampling frame? Well, this is a complete list of all cases in the population from which your sample will be drawn. So let's say that we are writing a research about the opinions of students at our university on accommodation. Now, your sampling frame will simply be the full list of students that are at the university. Meaning that if you would like to go for probability sampling techniques, you need to be able to obtain this full list of students that are at the university. That is the first step. Second of all, we are going to decide about our sample size. So first of all, we already know what our population is because we know the size of our sampling frame. Maybe it's 5,000 students that are studying at the university. Now we need to decide what is the proper sample size? Now, um, here we come to statistics, and this is not a statistics course, so I will be simplifying a lot. First of all, there are two sort of rules of thumb, and those are if your population is less than 50, then you should go away from probability sampling techniques. So if, it, if your population is 40 or 45, then the probability sampling techniques are not for you because some biases can occur. So rather in that case, go for non-probability sampling techniques. The second rule of thumb is that your sample size should be at least 30. I mean, we are going to go through some calculations of a sample size, but keep in mind that it's going to be always at least 30. Firstly, you need to decide about what we call a confidence level. This is the level of certainty that the characteristics of the data collected will represent the characteristics of total population. That's a bit of a hairy definition, but let's say that your confidence level is 95%. This 95% simply means that if you would select 100 uh, cases into your sample, 95% confidence level means that at least 95 of these cases will really represent the whole population. And I can tell you that really in most of the cases, the researchers are going for 95% confidence level. And that's also what you should go for. Secondly, you need to decide about what we call margin of error. Sometimes it's also called confidence interval. This is the accuracy you require for any estimates made from your sample. Again, a bit hairy definition, but in reality, it's quite simple and we hear it often in the television. Let's say that uh, you are asking students whether they are happy or not happy with the accommodation at uh, the university. Now, 47% of them said that they are happy. If your margin of error is 4%, what, how you should interpret the results should be that you put minus 4% and plus 4%, meaning that your result will not say 47% of students are happy with the accommodation. No, your result is that between 43 and 51% of students are happy with the accommodation. So you see, this is the margin of error. And I can tell you that researchers usually go for 3% or 5% margin of error. And that is as well what you should go for. All right, now we have our population size, maybe 1000. We have decided about our confidence level, which most likely is going to be 95%. Then as well, we have decided about margin of error, which is most likely going to be 
So we have these three numbers. What you should do now is that you should uh, go to Google and search for some calculator of a sample size. You are going to find tons of very relevant web pages. Now, when you come to some calculator of a sample size, it will ask you about these three numbers and you simply input your population size, your confidence level and your margin of error and it will calculate you what should your sample size be. So here is an example of how it might look like. Our population size is 1000, our confidence level is 95% and our margin of error is 5. The result that this calculator should give us is 278. We should have 278 cases in our sample so that our sample is constructed properly. So you see it is not that hard. Only thing you really need to know is your population size and then thanks to the use of these uh, confidence level, margin of error and some calculator of a sample size, you will be able to get this final result. We are now moving to step three, which is selecting a sampling technique so that we already have our sampling frame. It is most likely going to be some Excel sheet with maybe 1000 names of students at our university. Then as well, in step two, we have calculated our sample size, which we have made an example of 278 cases. Now, let's go through the sampling techniques. First of all, we have simple random sampling, and this is quite fun. So let's say that we have this our list of 1000 names. What we will do is that we will go to generator of random numbers, and we know that our sample size should be 278. So we will task this uh, generator of random numbers to generate for us 278 random numbers which are uh, not repeating and are within the range between 1 and 1000. So uh, this our result from a, a generator of random numbers can look like uh, first number is 5, second number is 978 and so on and so on. Now, when we have this list of random numbers between one and 1000, we will simply go to our sampling frame and we will select cases according to these random numbers, meaning that we will have a random selection of cases from our sampling frame. So you see, simple random sampling is really simple. Second of all, we have systematic random sampling. This is a bit more tricky because we need to calculate what we call sampling fraction. Now, our population size is 1000. We put it into the denominator. Our sample size is, let's say, 200. We put that in the denominator. Now, if we simplify this fraction, we end up with one fifth, meaning that we need to select one case from five cases in our sampling frame. Now we again go to our generator of random numbers, but this time we will ask the generator just for one random number, which will be between one and five, according to our sampling fraction. Now this generator is going to give us a result, let's say three. Three will be the first case from our sampling frame, which we will select. So we will go to the sampling frame, find number three, and that is the first case for us. Now, as our sampling fraction is one fifth, we know that now we need to take every fifth case. So if the first case is three, then second one is going to be eight, then 13, 18, 23, and so on and so on, until we select the, the whole sample. And again, you see the process was random because we have randomly selected our first case. So we got to a very similar result than if we would use the previously mentioned simple random sampling. This is just a different way. Third probability sampling technique that we can go for is called stratified random sampling. And this is a modification or a more advanced level from the previously mentioned two. So let's say that our population is 1,500 students currently uh, studying at the university and we are researching their satisfaction with current accommodation. Now we are going to create a stratification within this our sampling frame according to some relevant variable. And what can be a relevant variable for us? Well, it can be 
where they are currently living. So let's say that from these 1,500 students, 500 of them are living in single room dormitories, then 800 of them are living in shared flats and 200 are living in private apartments. Now, if our sample size is, let's say, 300, we need to accordingly select um, how many of the of the students, how many of the cases we are going to draw from each of these three groups, which we call also stratas. So from the first group of 5,000 students living in single room dormitories, we are going to select 100. From second group, it's going to be 160. And from third group, it's going to be just 40. So you see, we will make our results more relevant because we will have a sort of equal selection from all three categories or from the wall stratification. And now when we know these three numbers of how many students we should select from each group, we will use one of the previously described two techniques. So either a simple random sampling or systematic random sampling uh, to come up with a final list of cases. So you see, we can stratify our uh, sampling frame according to some relevant variable for us. The final probability sampling technique is what we call a cluster sampling. I do not really recommend going for it because it's a little bit tricky to justify and a little bit tricky to grasp. But let's go for it. Previously, we have discussed stratified random sampling where we identified a variable that is relevant for us and we stratified our population according to it into some groups. Now, in cluster sampling, we are going to do something similar. But instead of identifying this relevant variable for us, we will identify some naturally occurring variable. So that let's say we are researching companies in the whole country. Now, this naturally occurring variable for us can be geographical area. So maybe we will, uh, from these 1000 companies that are in the country that we are researching, we will group them by the district where their headquarters is located. Now, we will use again some uh, random numbers uh, to select clusters that we will research. So for instance, we have a list of districts, maybe it's 20 of them, and within each of these districts is some number of companies that are within our sampling frame. We will, for instance, decide that we want to research three of these clusters. So we will go for three random numbers, which will be maybe uh, district number five, district number nine, and district number 13. And our sample is going to be these three districts. So you see this cluster sampling, you know, you need to really find this naturally occurring variable, and then you sort of uh, stratify and group your population according to this naturally occurring variable. Finally, to make things a little bit more tricky, you can combine these sampling techniques. And this is happening quite often. For instance, you go for this stratify, let's say that you first go for cluster sampling and uh, you are researching all of the students that are in your country and their satisfaction level with their accommodation. First of all, you will go for cluster sampling and uh, your variable will be geographical area. So you'll be researching just some districts which were randomly selected. Then you will decide uh, to continue with stratified random sampling, meaning that again, you will stratify them according to their current accommodation. And finally, you will use simple random sampling to come up with your final list of cases that you are going to research. So you see these sampling techniques can be combined. So this is the end when we are discussing the probability sampling techniques. And in the upcoming video, we are going to go for non-probability sampling techniques.